What is up, friends? Welcome to another edition here of the Trail Trash Podcast. We are joined by a great friend of mine now, after having been on his show, Choose to Endure. He is, I'm going to go ahead and call him a 200-mile expert at this point, because he will go and do this race self-supported, which just blows my mind that he'll go and do what's called the Swami Shuffle. I believe it's called Screwed. We're also joined by the smoothest voice in podcasting. We are joined tonight by Richard Gleave, host of the Choose to Endure podcast. Richard, how you doing? Man, I'm pretty good. I don't know if I have the smoothest voice in podcasting. I mean, dude, you're pretty <laughs> close yourself. Uh, we might have to have a smooth off at some point. I don't know. Well, there we go. You and I can have a smooth off. That sounds very weird. You and I can have a voice off and you and Jason can have a gray beard off. <laughs> we'll just yeah, see. we definitely need a beard competition for, for the gray. There we go. So, um, yeah, so let's just go ahead and dive on in, man. Tell us about Choose to Endure, yeah. because that's where you and I had our first chat. We met in a Facebook group, kind of like a, however you want to phrase it, you know, looking for guests, be a guest uh, kind of thing. Um, where did that come from? How did that come to be? What was your thought process when you thought, I want to make this show and who it's geared to? Yeah, so... Uh, as as an English guy, of course, everything starts in a pub with beer, and that's how that's how the genesis of the show started as well. Last year, in it was probably October, uh, late October, I had been out and crewed a very good friend of mine out at Moab at uh, Moab Two Forty, and so I had just come back from that, and I was sitting in the pub with a couple of other ultra runner friends, local local folks. And I was telling them, I was relaying the story of, of you know, our friend's journey and then other people we met on the way and all the drama of the finish line. And, uh, you know, so we, we were just kind of getting into the story. And uh, the, the we, we thought, wow, this would be like, there are so many great stories out there for people that aren't at the front end of the ultra running races. And this is not the only one, but. But yeah, we were like, there's got to be a vehicle to tell the story of sort of back of the pack runners and uh, all of the, um, you know, all of the great experiences they have and the heroic efforts they put in. Uh, you know, there's so much focus on the front. I think I just wanted to tell the story and share the experience of the sort of 90% of the, or the or more, the majority of people at the back, because there's so much there. Uh, and so much effort um, that I think they're sort of a little bit underrepresented. So that was really the genesis of of the podcast. It was just, hey, look, let's go find some people, find some stories, tell the stories, tell my own stories to some degree, and see where it goes. And so I think we're almost 25 episodes in and still kind of fine-tuning what we like to put on the show and the types of content we want to put out. We're trying out different different episode styles, if you will. But so far, the reception's been pretty good. Um, you know, we're getting some good listens, we're getting some good feedback, trying to create a community out there and driving some some interaction and, and really find out what that listener base wants to hear, what's important, what do back of the pack people care about, uh, in addition to the stories uh, that, that are out there. So that was really the 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 start of it and yeah it's it's gone pretty well so far i think you're right when you say that you know the back of the pack is is kind of where all your inspiration is it's where all your golden hour to me is is the best part of our sport i love golden hour i've been part yeah. of golden hour myself so <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's just when you get to just see it there's no i guess there's no dry eye for lack of a better way to describe it when that last runner comes across the finish line uh, and having been very close to that last runner myself, I, I empathize with every single person that is out there fighting those cutoffs because it's uh it's a special feeling. So kudos to you for bringing their voices uh, to the public. So I do appreciate you doing that. So um, now, so you kind of marketed as this kind of back of the pack kind of thing. Is that where you find yourself in most of your races? Uh, Cause you did kind of mention that you were bringing your own stories to this. Uh, yeah. is, 
is that kind of where you find yourself as a back of the pack cutoff chaser or where are you in your running journey? And uh, looking at your run, your ultra sign up, you've got a stout history here, sir. So, <laughs> so, well, so are you fighting cutoffs yourself? Uh, yes. Today, yes. It hasn't always been that way. I would, I would have considered myself a good few years ago a solid middle of the pack. And then over time with age and just injury and, and one or two other things, I, I would say at the moment, yes, I would put myself towards the back of the pack. Um, in fact, I, I had my first DNF last year where I missed the cutoff. Now, I had a couple of ex, you know, extraneous circumstances on that. I fell and broke my shoulder in the middle of the race. Um, and well, let's talk about still, that. How did you? How did yeah. <laughs> so, so again, I mean, because the image I have is we, you tumbling down the side of the trail and just kind uh, of doing this little. That's pretty much it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, a a race, a really cool race, actually, over in England called the Lakeland One Hundred. It's a. It's I think the biggest race in the UK, uh, numbers wise, and it's set in the Lake District, in the northwest of England. It's this amazing place to go full of kind of mountains, lakes, as the name would uh, uh, intimate, uh, but just the most beautiful scenery out there. And it runs sort of town to town over the hills, over the mountains from one town to the next. But it is famous for its absolutely atrocious weather. Um, so, yeah, I was running this race and uh, I... I was one of, I think, seven or 800 uh, 100 mile runners. So this was a 100 mile race. I think there were 1,500 mile. Did I, yeah. Did I and and at, at the halfway point, the 50 milers chip in, and there was, I think, 1,500 of those. That's so a it's a race. big race. <laughs> and it actually started that the first mile of the race, you're running out of this tiny town in the Lake District, and the whole town came out and lined the road. So if you've ever seen, when they start UTMB and CCC and those races and the town comes out, um, that's the exact experience that it was. It was it tingles down the back of your neck as you're running through the streets and all these people are out, thousands of people coming out. Anyway, I got up the first climb. It starts at 6 p.m. So you're going off into darkness almost. Within the first two hours, it goes dark and then you start climbing. And I think until I... I missed the cutoff. I had done over a nine, nine and a half thousand feet of climbing in about 32 miles, which is uh, pretty intense. And yeah. uh, so it's all, all at night and all on really technical trail. So about halfway up the second climb, uh, the heavens opened sideways driving rain. And so I'm trying to come down a uh, a, a very steep very technical trail and i just uh, my footing went from under me in the mud and i smashed my shoulder on a on a jutting up rock and uh and busted up my shoulder and then and that wasn't actually uh, so i was quite proud of that actually it was a dnf but i didn't dnf because of the injury mm -hmm. i dnf because i was so slow it, it with 700 people ahead of me the mud path which is like a foot and a half wide it, it was a dirt path it turned into a like an inch thick slick mud and so i even with poles i was struggling to get any kind of traction and it was such slow going from me and everybody in front of me because the path got churned up with all those other folks and so i mean you you would walk start walking up a hill and the person in front of you would slide backwards into your into your i mean it was so slow <laughs> um so eventually i i kept losing time at each checkpoint and uh Ultimately, I think the fifth checkpoint is when I uh, when I timed out. So I DNF because I timed out, not because I uh, fractured my humerus, actually, which was not at all funny. Uh, no, but no. Uh, <laughs> it hurt like hell <laughs> to say right. no. uh, uh, later diagnosed. But yes, that that's my one and only DNF. So I'm quite proud of 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 that record really um good deal but yes uh i would say these days i'm a little slower a little more towards the back of the pack especially with the longer distances mm -hmm. i'm still trying to figure those out although i have quite a bit of experience at them uh and we may get into it in a bit but i love the journey style racing the especially the the longer 200s 
They mm-hmm. just, uh, they, they very much appeal to me. What is it yeah. about him? Oh, go ahead, John. No, I think we're about to ask the same question. Uh, you know, what is the appeal for you of like the 200 mile distance? Um, I think the three of us would agree that a hundred miles for, you know, three of us is more than enough. And I can out yeah. get to that 100 mile mark and then turn it around and doing like another hundred. Yeah. It, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, for me, it's the challenge. It's the challenge of doing it. And I like to do them almost alone. Uh, so you, we mentioned screwed. That That's kind of how I run these things. Um, but you get to do it a lot slower usually than the 100. And there's way less stress. I mean, even uh, even in 100, you can be chasing cutoffs pretty early in in a race. In the two yeah. hundreds, there's usually so much time. I mean, there most of them are a hundred hours or or up, depending I, on what kind of two two hundred it is. I feel like a lot of the two hundreds I've heard about have, we'll call them generous cutoffs. Yeah, oh. yeah, and and it's way less stressful. So you can sort of take your time. You can enjoy the race. You can enjoy the scenery. You can slow down a little bit, which is way less taxing on your body than even a hundred would be. You know, a hundred's pretty taxing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but once you slow down and, and start to, you, and again, for me, running the long races is, is as much about me mentally and finding myself and exploring and going on the journey and understanding how to, how to adapt and react when, when things happen. And the, those 200 miles, you're out there for so long that something is going to go wrong, right? It's an sure. eating contest and it's a sleeping contest, even more so than the hundred. Like if you if you're not eating and sleeping correctly on a 200 mile, you are going to have a really really hard time finishing that race, no matter what pace you're going. So, all of the problems that you've got to solve when you're out on a course for three, four, five days, and and figuring things out by yourself as you go, I think is just a a really cool puzzle to solve, and every one of them is different. But I, I love doing them for, for the journey and for the self-discovery. And I go I go try and find places that I've never been to before. And so you get to spend some time in that place, sort of being a part of the scenery almost, running through it and getting to know people, um, certainly in the in the journey styles, maybe less so in the mountain two hundreds. But uh yeah, it's just it's just I, I think it's it's an awesome challenge and the puzzle of figuring each one of those out is is different every time and something that really appeals to me that and i'm slower anyway so now i'm buying myself more time um to to get on the race but uh yeah I, uh, to get done with the race but i mean i think um i don't know i i don't think they're as bad as people you i think people hear 200 and they go oh, I, i'll never do that but I think if you got out there and gave it a go, I think you'd find it quite different. It's much like saying after a 50 mile, geez, I couldn't turn around to do another 50 miles. I'm like, I'm spent right now. And and then you find yourself doing a hundred and you think, oh, that it was a bit slower, um, you know, but I could still do it. And and that's the, the thing with the 200s is that you have these waves and they come like in a hundred, you might have one, you know, you might have one or two waves at mile 30. Usually for me is where I have a dip and then you rally until 60 and then you have another dip and that may last another 20, 25 miles until you start getting close to 90. And mentally you think, Oh, I'm, I'm almost done now. So I'm going to pick myself up and, and get to the finish where that, at that point you're halfway in a 200. So it's, it's this constant up and down and, and managing yourself. And I just think it's a, uh, it's this really interesting puzzle to find out who you are when when you have to adapt uh, and and solve uh, you know solve these things on the go to get to the end of the race. And they, and like you said, they give, they typically give you a pretty generous amount of time to do that. It, it's it's very unusual to find a, a short cut off two hundred. I mean, you're you're usually paying a lot for the race. The race organizers <laughs> have put a lot in. And, uh, um, so they give you, like, it's designed to have, to, to give you enough time to get through and, and mostly make the race. Like you could walk most of a 200, I would say, and still be pretty close to finishing. Got so it. what are your, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, Candace's 
three hundred miler that she just announced. Well, oh, yeah, the Arizona Monster as a uh, as a race. I think uh, I think that'll be that'll be a fantastic race. You know, I'm I'm up for Cocodona next year, and so the Arizona Trail, the 300, I think would be right up my street. And I, I will say this though, I'm not a huge fan of the destination trail stuff, um, just based on on the Moab experience I had, plus uh, you know the experience that I heard from Tahoe and and Bigfoot from other people. I don't. I don't know if I go on record. I'm not a huge fan of destination trail stuff. So would I do it as a race? I think it's awesome. Yes. I think I'd have to see something different from them as a race organization company for me to stump up two grand to to go run the race and then potentially another few thousand on top of that for crew to go and all that other stuff. So yeah, that was um, that was gonna be that was gonna be my next question. You already answered it for me because I I had um um interviewed a, a gentleman by the name of Wes Plate who uh, is kind of oh, like yeah. Just, oh yeah, I love so, Wes. Yeah, yeah. So and uh, Wes, as just like yourself, is a, a two hundred mile specialist. Uh, yeah, and 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 he he completed her triple crown last year uh, or the year before last, and um. And, and, you know, was talking a lot about those races. And I just finished watching Jail Peltier's um, Moab 240 video. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I don't know anything ab about those races other than just like what I see on like on like YouTube or what mm -hmm. I've heard from like a very small sampling of people that have participated in the race. Um, you know, like I had heard. um I'd interviewed uh, some folks who had ran Cogadona very early on and talked about how, you know, there was some issues where there was, um, they struggled with aid um, yeah. in between sections and folks were running out of water and was really struggling and like drinking out of like creeks and stuff, trying to stay, you know, hydrated. And, and I'm sure, and I'm sure you can speak to this a little bit since you've participated in it. I'm sure logistically that has to be a huge challenge uh, because you can't really piece a lot of aid stations together um, in a, in a race that big. So they, they, there has to be some, some space in between them, at mm -hmm. least the big loot type courses. Um, and I don't know, I'm not super familiar with the ones that you've participated in. Was that kind of the scenario in the ones you ran where there were big gaps in between aid? Can be yes, for sure, uh, and and up in the mountains like like Cocodona and and Moab and and the others. I mean, those are naturally huge huge distances in some cases between aid stations. Yeah, um, it so I'm, it's definitely. I'm, I'm, a, I was going to say, I'm sure that can be a challenge trying to plan that out, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, trying to figure out how much water you're going to need, how much fluid you got to take, how much food you got to take. Um, for, you know, from the runner perspective, that's a huge challenge. And I can imagine from the race director perspective as well, like, how are you going to get, how are you going to get the stuff you need from an aid for an aid station all the way to where it needs to be? And what are you going to do if it runs out? So, I mean, I, I totally sympathize with, with race directors. Um, but yeah, the, the experience, uh, my own experience of just crewing over at Moab last year was not a particularly great one from a, from a crew perspective and an aid station perspective. And I, you know, chatting to other crews as you do when you, when you're doing those sorts of things, it, it, um, it, it didn't seem like a one-off. Uh, it, it seemed like the other races had, had similar stuff going on. So, um, I think the Arizona trail looks a fantastic race route. And I think it would be wonderful as, as is Moab and, and I'm sure Tahoe and, and Bigfoot as well. Um, I would just want to see and feel a little bit more loved maybe from the, uh, race organization for my two grand input. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, so oh, you had that uh, 200 Swami and, and we yeah, kind of talked yeah. about it there where you were talking about logistics of it all. Looking yes. back at your Instagram story and all that stuff, uh, you did a lot of gas station shopping. Is that very much so? 
is that because of the logistics of it all or is yeah. that because you just like a honey bun like i do or <laughs> dude you're taking your life in your own hands when you go to 7-Eleven at 10 o'clock at night and order all of the warm food <laughs> they've got left that's been in that warmer for like, I don't know how long. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I had to do. But yes, that and that was really one of the appeals of that race. I mean, that race... Uh, so, so, so real quick, that race, that takes place on uh, NC12, right? Along the Outer Banks? It does, yes. Straight yeah. down the Outer Banks. It, yes, it yeah, starts... That's, in, um, yeah, that's actually a really fascinating area on its own. It is. It's uh, and I've never been anywhere near that area before. So mm -hmm. that was part of a little part of the appeal for me. It was like it was a new place to go, and I had never been anywhere near uh, North Carolina in my time over here. So I really wanted to go and check it out, and I got a lot of good feedback on that part of North Carolina. The the Outer Banks is really pretty and uh, a really wonderful place to go. The, the main part of that race for me was the uh, ch charity aspect. So Swami of the Swami Shuffle was a former Marine, did two tours of, of Iraq and um, came back and uh, unfortunately succumbed to suicide. And so the race is sort of in his name. Uh, and the race organization is set up that they only do this race and they do it specifically to support a charity called mission 22 which is a charity that that helps veterans suffering from ptsd and other mental challenges it, it sort of uh, puts activities and, and money behind helping them helping them to get through so just from a from that angle i thought i've got a lot of friends i've got family too over here in the us on my wife's side that are vets and uh, th that race just appealed to me from that angle, in addition to the fact that it's, it's somewhere that I'd never been before, uh, and it was a 200, and it was sort of this, what I'm calling, I, I don't know if it's the right term, but the, this sort of journey style 200s, which is essentially take yourself from town to town through a place and, uh, you know, work your way along the course. So, um, so yeah, I, I did that. I did that screwed, but the logistics of it was a really interesting puzzle because it was in, it was at the end of February down the Outer Banks, which is a heavily tourist area. And it followed Route 12. So it was road the whole way. I mean, it was literally one road for 110 miles. You reach a lighthouse, you turn around, and you run back up the road the other way, 110 miles to the where you started. Um, and the first 22, 23 miles, and then obviously the last 23 miles was all beach. Yeah, so it was um, I ran a running. 100, I ran a 100K, like a long, it would be that same course, like through there. It, it started at Nags Head, though. I went down. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's Tatarus. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's Brilliant. a fascinating course. It's interesting. Um, formerly there's actually a race that started at the NC Virginia border and went all the way down okay. to the South Carolina and North Carolina border, all like Wonderful. 278 miles. And you would have to take like Brilliant. ferries across some of them. Um, <laughs> but what I'm interested in is, uh, what type of like weather did you encounter there? Cause like, when I was out there, there's like so much like sand and just grit in the air that you just, yeah. just constantly get like pelted by it. And, um, yes. at nighttime, there's so much of that grit in the air that, visibility was awful like at twilight well, exactly that it's it's sort of uh shimmered at night because there was so much floating grit in the air being battered around it was totally windy so obviously the uh the wright brothers flight museum is right there in in kitty hawk and you can totally see why they would pick that spot because the wind never stopped the entire time we were we were going down there but yeah it, it was um the weather was very cold to very hot to very cold to driving rain and free, frigid freezing winds. So pretty much the whole thing. And and again, I'm doing this screwed. Other people had a crew. So they had a crew that drove down and met them in, in certain places. But I think myself and one other chap, Mike Horner, we were we finished very close to each other. We actually did the last few miles together. Uh, uh, on the beach, I think we were the first two back that were screwed. We and I didn't, ha you know, 
I, I and I don't think he had anybody helping them the whole way. So it's like you, you're on your own. Um, but <clears throat> so the weather was pretty bad. So you got to figure out right out of the gate. I got to be able to carry everything in my pack that I think I'm going to need. So you got to have multi-use gear with you that you're lugging the whole way down and the whole way back. Some of it you'll use, some of it maybe you won't use. But with that changing weather, like you're going to have a change of clothes. What are you? What are you going to? What are you going to take with you? I mean, it's a question you have to. Everybody has to answer. If you're not, if you don't have a support crew, what are you going to take with you in your pack as you're going? Because it has to cover as many eventualities as you can think of along the way. So, did you overpack or underpack, or did you pack think, just the right amount? I think I packed just the right amount for the most part i i was there anything you didn't off, use i guess that you packed that you thought well i'm gonna need this and turns out you didn't no i don't think there was uh only because the last night that i ran through with mike uh we had we just as we hit the beach the heavens opened and it downpoured on us for probably an hour and a half. So we we had every bit of clothing on, trying not to get trying not to get as wet as possible. And the moment it stopped raining, the wind turned and we were running into a head-on, really really cold wind. So we were having a big problem on the beach from potential hypothermia on being on a beach, obviously at night, no mm -hmm. sun very very cold wind to where you know when you your nose is running and and you can't talk because your because your mouth is getting all <laughs> uh, so i mean it was it was it was pretty bad at times and there was no way to get out of it because you're on a you're on an open beach there's very little you could do we couldn't sit we couldn't stand this is this is 200 miles and it ended up being 220 miles the race it's 110 out 110 back so we're 200 miles into a 220 mile race we're not moving very fast at this point. And I've got uh, my ankle swell, sw swelled up huge. So I'm sort of hobbling as it is. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a pretty bleak night. I think it took us eight hours to do like a 23 mile section down a beach, uh, which, you know, beach running is never great in the first place. But... I was going to say, you lost <laughs> me at beach. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it was soft sand and, and, uh, as uh, uh, John was saying, there's a border there, and and it had a it had a flashing red light on on the border. There's a fence there to stop the wild horses crossing over into Virginia, the wild horses of Corolla, which is mm -hmm. very cool, by the way, uh, roaming horses. But this the fence had a flashing red light on it, and you can see it for miles and miles and miles, and that's all you could see at night was this damn flashing light and we're like is that is that thing ever getting any closer like where the hell is that right so, I was about yeah, to say, was, how how many times are you like is it closer just, no i think it's farther no, away now no, no, oh yeah like is it moving <laughs> like what what is it doing that light so yeah it's uh, a, a total mental game at, at that point um but yeah we couldn't stop we were soaked both of us were soaked even with our rain gear on it rained so hard for an hour and a half that we were we were just uh shaking we couldn't anytime we sat down we were right in the wind we were getting buffeted we couldn't really get out of it we sat on sand so there's sand everywhere and uh i think i don't think we stopped more than five minutes at any point coming back just because we we, we were shaking and shivering so bad what was your uh, sleep strategy carry like? on yeah what was your sleep strategy oh. like for that and yeah which kind of leads me to my next thing we'll just go ahead and ask what kind of hallucinations yeah. did you have? Because we all have them at 100 miles. I can only imagine they're amplified at 200. <laughs> you know, I've learned to do this well enough to where I don't really have hallu hallucinations, believe it or not. Um, it's part of the fun, though. <laughs> yeah, well, it is, yes. Uh, I, I have had hallucinations in lesser mile races when I first started running, running ultras. Um, but... Uh, I think I managed myself really well from a sleep and fuel perspective during this race. So um, sadly, I didn't have a whole lot of hallucinations to report back on this one. Oh, well, that's um, a letdown. No. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I wish I had more. I wish I had a cooler story. But the truth <laughs> is that I actually managed myself really well. That was one of the big logistical challenge food because you're in the Outer Banks. It's a very, very touristy area. 
And in February, there aren't a whole lot of tourists there. So pretty much everything had closed down for the season and hadn't reopened yet. And so on the first day, which was a Sunday, so it's Sunday afternoon, you start on a Sunday. So you start running down this Highway 12, you start hitting towns there and nothing is open. And so I had enough water on me to get through like the first beach section and then refill at the first convenience store you come to or something. Well, I managed to get that, but then everything after that closed, closed. And I'm looking up on Google, on Google, Google Maps, like what's open and it would be like temporarily closed, temporarily closed, closed for the season. And you're like, oh, hell, where am I going to get anything here? Which is part of the challenge then of being screwed. It's like you've got to figure out this this sort of question of, okay, what's open? And that's where gas stations started to become a bigger thing because they, they were realistically the only thing open on a Sunday in the outer banks of North Carolina off season. So yeah, I, I, I'm not ashamed to say I ducked in a, a, a Nope. We'll pick up. Is everyone else still here? I'm yeah. Still here. Yeah. I'm a BP busy. gas station over there and got some. And then try to come back uh, as, as much as as far as I could. Um, but I realized on the way down that there was so little food and water available that there were some long sections of 23, 24 miles with no access to anything. I mean, they were completely remote. Uh, there's a section called P Island, which is uh, there's nothing, not a shop anywhere for 24 miles so before you get on that section you got to make sure you're tooled up you're fed and watered because it's going to take you like seven eight hours to get to the other end of that before you even have a chance of getting any other food or water um, and this is the beauty of these races with no aid stations it's sort of a do it yourself you figure it out wherever you want to stop is good if you want to stop and get a motel you can if you feel like you want to carry on, you can do that too. Um, yeah, this uh, race, it, 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 that's interesting. You kind of say that because, like, I've heard like Laz talk about his Vol State race, and when yeah. people like cross the ferry at the start of that, then it instantly like strips you away. It's like your most like basic needs. It's like where am I going to eat? Where am I going to get water? It's where totally am I true. Sleep? <laughs> Which I just... think is very it's it's a very different concept. One being crude. When you know where your crew is going to meet you so mm -hmm. those people who are crewed they had a they didn't even carry a pack to some in some of those people were running without a pack because they their crew met them every three or four miles so they just carried a a water bottle and ran but me i've got a 10 11 pound pack on and i'm trying to carry everything that i'm needing for four days out um but yeah it really does boil down to very quickly where can i get water or where can i get something to eat and that's it. And then thirdly is sleep, but that's kind of third behind the first two. And that's really, it's so cool. It's, that's all you got to think about for three to four days. You don't have any other, any other worries and you very quickly get focused on the, the basics. Yeah. Um, so and also, so uh, speak, speaking of Vol State, do you have any aspirations to come up here to Tennessee and run that sometime? That was my yes. next question. Thank you, John. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's definitely on my list. I, funnily enough, uh, living in Texas, I suck at running in the heat, and <laughs> well, 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 that's Vol State is very hot too. Because not uh, only well, do we have that heat, we have that humidity, which is just yeah, will absolutely just kick you down. Well, so I'm here in Houston and we have the humidity. Uh, the Southeast Texas is very similar to that. It's, it's humid okay. and it's hot. So when the sun goes down, the humidity goes right up and you can't breathe. Uh, and then the sun comes up, the humidity drops a bit, but it's a hundred degrees. So I'm right with you on that. I love the idea of Vol State. I'm just, I need to convince myself that I can, you know, as, as I've read a lot of race reports on that one, I think a lot of people have started to run it as more or less a night race uh, yeah. and and kind of run through the night until like midday, two o'clock, and then go find somewhere to hole up through the heat of the day and then get back at it later. So yes, I love that style of racing. There is a couple more. There is a 400 miler up in New York called the Fool's 409. 
so I'd love to do that one. That's very similar kind of uh, kind of stretch that goes from Niagara all the way across New York State and finishes on the border with Vermont through the Adirondacks. Um, so that sounds like a really cool race too. But that, I think that one's in fall. Uh, but yes, Vol State is definitely on my list once I can sort of talk myself into running in either heat or humidity. Yeah, um, if if you do come up here for that, um, Jason just got a new car that needs to be broken in. Uh, I don't think he's carrying <laughs> ah. any ultra runners in there yet, so he'd be happy to crew you if needed. <laughs> you know what? Perfect. I would yeah. be happy. I would be happy to drive beside you and hand you stuff from the car. Uh, <laughs> if you needed to ride in the car, I would attach a wagon to the back of the vehicle. There you go, and uh, and I would tow you along the way. Because uh, let me tell you a story. My wife said, "Please don't let this one smell like the other one." Oh, so so, so uh, now, fantastic. literally, literally, every time I go run, I change all my clothes. And use a half a can of degree body spray. Uh, today I did the same thing after I had my little short run with some friends, and I walk in the house, and my wife is like, "Good lord, you smell so bad!" And I'm like, "What do you mean? I used a half a can of degree body spray?" And she said, "Jason, no one little, wants. It's a little much." And I was like, "Look, you said you didn't want the car to stink," and she said. I said I didn't want it to stink of your sweat. She goes, now it's going to stink of degree body spray. No one wants their smell. car to smell like a middle school locker room, Jason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've gone from like one extreme totally to the you, other. You, you can't look. You can't have it all. So either there's it's got to be, be a middle ground. It, there's no middle ground, my friend. Okay, it's either <laughs> it's either it's either ass or it's. Or it's degree body spray. Okay, you you can't have it's it's one or the other. And so it's I want to do or ass, <laughs> axe exactly. or ass. Yeah. yeah so so pretty some much old spice it, thrown in there. That you know what I, I I have a can of old spice. So thank you for there you go. That. That's I mean, uh it's, it's, it is the Fiji. Folks of our age, uh, we go back to old spice for sure. Um, yes, we. The, you know, the, you remember the, the 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 white bottle with the little lid yeah. that you pull it off and you. Sp you threw a splash on, um, yeah. You know, yeah. I remember that, and uh, my granddad lived off the old brute. Uh, oh, get some oh. brute going, yeah. Oh and yeah, the green, brute, that dark green bottle. The yeah. dark brute. green bottle, man. Are you trying yes. to smell like you in the trenches? If you, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you could smell that man from a mile away, walking down the freaking he, he garden, and so he would garden with a half a can of brute on, and so he'd be out there Fantastic. like you know shucking corn smelling like you know brute i have to wonder i have to wonder what i smelled like coming up after 110 miles because i only took one change of clothes so because i couldn't really carry a whole lot more right so i i went I mean, after 110 before I mean, changing let's, let's, let's be honest after 30 miles you you smell the same which is horrible yeah. so i mean 30 100 150 200 if you don't there's nothing you can do i mean you can mask it by putting on a fresh shirt for like what five ten minutes but ultimately that stench <laughs> that stench is going to it's going to come through and you're going to you're going to stink regardless so i mean i mean i'm sure you smelled like anybody else that just had ran 110 miles so yeah but yes. Coop would tell us to tell him that he smelled like roses and his feet looked great and that angle wasn't swollen. It was just the angle that he had when he was yeah. looking down at it. <laughs> and and yeah. I tell you what, and I tell you what, Richard, you come here and run Ball State. I will have a can of degree. And as you run by, I'll throw a mist on you. Just, yeah, mist. Just a little mist. Like those, uh, just a little, little spritz. Little spritz. Yeah, little spritz on the on the pass. Yeah. That's right. But in all seriousness, if you do run it, at least you've got people local that if you know. Of course, you're probably going to run it screwed, but you still have people locally in case you need it. So, I mean, me and Garrett are right along the hmm. the, the path, I believe, to some extent. Can never remember how it runs, but anyway, we're we're local, so mm -hmm. and we have we know lots of people that's finished it. So fantastic! Well, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's just uh, I just got to convince myself that I can run that through the heat. But uh, but yes, I I love that style of racing. It's so really hold on, cool. hold on. I have the perfect tune-up for you. So mm -hmm. we do this to all guests 
It's the official. That's right, folks. It's the official strolling gym plug of the uh, of the episode. Uh, Garrett, we yeah. do this to every guest. So, so Lass has another race. I'm sure you've heard if if you haven't heard of it. It's called Strolling Gym. It's one of the oldest uh, ultras in the United States, and it's held here in Tennessee. It's held in May, um, but this one's only 40 miles. So for you, you would just be warmed up. Um, yeah. so, but just some but, gentle rolling hills, but, but nothing to really worry about, but, 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 Strolling. But, look, but look, it's humid and it's hot. So you can come down, you can, you can dip the toe in the water, see how you feel mm. after 40 miles of strolling gym, and then decide if you want to multiply that times like eight. Yeah. Seven, maybe. But anyway, it would be very similar to running it screwed because there's just jugs of water on the side for your aid jugs, station. jugs of water so, from, yeah from, from kroger's oh, and, and and um hold on they do offer slim gyms i believe at mile 33 or 35 you, you can have a slim gym um yeah, they do yeah. have these smaller slim gyms the um aid stations are staffed by like half schoolers uh, who don't know anything about ultra running which, which is fine but, uh, <laughs> Wonderful. I think, uh, I think makes year, it more yeah, challenging like, yeah, I think uh, one year they had they had like uh, prunes they were offering at one of the aid stations. Prunes? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, in all in all honesty, you think that we are joking? <laughs> we are not. Okay, there is a race director who tells the story, a well known race director, and I can use his name because he told it on my show. Jason Green, one year needed some water. He couldn't. The aid station had ran out of water. He walked over to somebody's cooler, you know, that had the water in the bottom of the cooler in it. Oh. And he drank dirt water oh. from the cooler because there was nothing left for him to drink. <laughs> like the melted ice water in the bottom of yes. the cooler? Yes. Yeah. He said there was like dirt and grass in it. But anyway, regardless. Yeah, it will kill you. You'll be all right. But in all seriousness, though, this race is a gym. It is probably one of the best races in all the Southeast. John, am I right? It's a classic. I feel like it's one that everyone would benefit from running at least once. We're still working on go. Garrett over here. Um, I don't think we're making a very compelling argument, but I, I think everyone should run it at least once. <laughs> and you and Garrett, not- you and Garrett can run it together. It's not the there race that I wouldn't do. It's the timing of the race because it's like typically the first part of May, right? Yeah, it's usually like the very first hot weekend in May, so you're not heat acclimated either. It's really convenient. Which just happens to be right around the time that my daughter's birthday is. It so, before. sorry, strolling Jim. You, you mean your daughter doesn't want to have a birthday party at the Tennessee Walking Horse Museum? I, mean, come I come am on, pretty come sure... On. Now, That's if it classy. was called the Tennessee Walking Flamingo Museum, she'd be all about it right now. But it, it would. N- no. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you think, because I'm looking, like I said, I've got your, your ultra sign up here. There's a 300K. There's all these <clears throat> yeah. ridiculous distances. At what point is too far for you? If someone would say, hey, we've got this 500 miler. Here's a comp entry. Are you like, no, mm. 500 is too far? You know, because no. we kind of asked, I forget who it was, we asked uh, Stephen Cornhouse last week. We were talking oh, about, yeah. you know, because yeah, yeah. he's got some longer distance cut races coming up. Um, and kind of, you know, Candace's 200 is the new 100 kind of thing. Right. Where do you see this adventure style racing going from here? Uh, now she's got this 300. Do we start to see a couple more 300s? We've got Vol State, which is what 3,000 K or something like that. I don't remember. Um, it's it's 500 kilometers. Okay, same thing. Whatever. No. Um, but, but where do you see it going? Seeing as how this is your area of enjoyment, I think it goes and goes and goes because I. You know, you hear about all these FKTs now as well down like the Arizona Trail and and Appalachian Trail. And and it's becoming more and more prevalent and more and more mainstream for people to go try these FKTs, which can be way longer than the 300 miles, right? Multi-day stuff. 
So I think there's a massive amount of scope for these races to expand. I think Candace is right. I mean, there was a time when there were only a couple of 200s knocking around and everyone was like, there's no way you have to be super elite to finish that. There's no way I could finish the 200. And then slowly over the past few years, you've, you've started to see a whole lot more, what do you call it? You know, the likes of the likes of me finishing these things. Um, and suddenly people think, well, I can do that. And so more and more people are now doing the 200 and they're finding they can, they can finish that. So I think, I don't know where the end is, but I think we'll start to see, uh, like the New York race, that's a 400 mile race. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're already starting to see three and 400 mile races and suddenly Ball State, the 500 K of Ball State, which was mind blowing only a few years ago, suddenly now starts to fall within a range that people can shoot for. And so you'll start, you, you'll see more and more of these, um, uh, longer races pop up so i don't know where the limit is i would love to see a 500 mile race but then you've got these these crazy ones around uh what's the one that's uh i think it's around a block of new york yeah the, uh, like, yeah yeah uh you know which is like thousands um mm -hmm. so what I, I think i think a thousand somebody will get to a thousand at some point maybe not in the next few years but i i think somebody will get there um and then uh, the guy did you did you see uh hard geezer he mm -hmm. just uh the, the uk bloke who who went mm -hmm. from like uh, up africa yeah yep. so, so i mean people are doing these things and suddenly people are you know other folks are realizing wow it's not it's not something i can't do like somebody did this and it wasn't an elite person so mm -hmm. maybe i can get closer to where i'm you know get closer to it but yeah, it's it's a it's a mental thing. I think you. So, what's your see... thoughts on the, what, what what what's your thoughts on backyards then, the backyard yeah. style race? Because I'm curious how the, you feel about those. Those are those are pretty interesting. There's still there's still a speed element as part of backyards, though. You you've got to get round. I mean, yeah, it starts. It's four point one six or whatever it is. You still got to get around those four miles where the longer these longer races it's very much up to you where and when you stop unless there are the big aid stations a long way in, in in the big races but um yeah I, I i don't know i think there's a limit to backyards but i don't think there's a limit to these big long races quite as much as the backyards are i think you might start to see You'll you'll see a 500 miler at some point, but I really think Lululemon did a great thing with their further event, and I think you may start to see we're putting this event on for this week. However far you can run in this yeah. seven days, I think you yeah. might start to see a couple more of those. I know it's six days. I'm just saying seven days because seven Sunday Saturday to Saturday. You got to give people a travel day to get home. So, um, but I know Lulu did it in six. <laughs> Um, but you, you, I think you might start to see some more things like that, which may be a great way for more people to say, Hey, you know, I really want to see if I can do this 200 miler. Here's this week long event. I've got some time to burn at work. Let's go ahead and just try this. Uh, I think you might start to see a couple more of those things pop up and then you get some maybe big name race directors or some other, uh, not saying that they would, but Era Vipa would probably do a fantastic job with something like that. Uh, if they were to kind of dip their toe into that, I think they would be, um, they would set the bar pretty high. I feel like if they were to do something like that. So, yeah, I think it's interesting. You, you bring up the time away, and and that might actually be a limiter. And I say that from the perspective of somebody with a family at home and a job. Like most of us are right. Most mm -hmm. most of us are not elite, but but yeah, the two hundred milers typically take a week to run, and so if you're thinking twice that long, the the New York race I haven't signed up for yet, even though I I love it because it's four hundred miles, and that would take 10, 10, 11 days to do. Now I I first of all I couldn't take eleven days PTO from work. <laughs> Neither would I want to be a, like saddle my wife with looking after kiddo and all the household stuff for 11 days. So, I mean, I know it sounds kind of silly, but I, I think that might be a limiter for a lot of people on, on finishing mm -hmm. these, uh, these mm -hmm. super long races, like even 200 is, 
it's a challenge. There's only a couple of those that I can do a year. I just don't have the time because each one is a week, a full week away. You got to you got to typically fly there. You got to have a day before, run the race, four days. You probably want a day after to get some kind of recovery before you before you're heading back. So yeah, I mean they're they're a pretty significant time input, and I wonder if you know the 300 mile. Uh, race and a 400 mile race and ultimately a 500 miler. I wonder if people have time to do that, even if they have the will and the energy to do it. I mean, it's going to have to be someone who's self-employed uh, CEO type of thing that can just delegate their job. Uh, or yeah. it's one of these elite runners that, you know, this is what I'm paid to do. Um, we talk about her a lot because we love her Camille Heron. Like that would be like, she doesn't like right. that's her job is to go do right, these things. Right. Uh, so someone like that could easily be like, yeah, I'm going to go run for two weeks straight and see how far I can go. Uh, that kind of thing. I don't know who would be more mad, uh, my boss or my wife, if I said, hey, I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. I think they both might have my head on a platter. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I try to do, I'd like to do a couple of these in a, in a year. But but yeah, when you when you look at okay, each one of those is a week. If I do two or three races that are two hundred miles, and each one of those is a week each, that's two or three weeks just on me, and then the family vacation and uh, other stuff that comes up through the year. That that's that's difficult to do. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. So we kind of talked about you know pre-show kind of where we would go with your running overseas and all that stuff. Mm. What are some of the primary differences? Because I've never been over there. Um, I have dreams and ambitions to go, but mainly to go catch an Arsenal game, uh, more so than go oh. run a race. Um, what what are some of the big differences between running over there versus running over here? Now, granted, here in the southeast, it's very technical. If you've ever spent any time on the Appalachian Trail, that's pretty much what all the Tennessee is like. It's very rocky, rooty, not your plush trails of the Pacific Northwest. Is that kind of yeah. what it's more like over there? I know you mentioned yeah that nasty fall. So yeah, uh, there are the nice trails, but mostly it's sort of dirt, grass, or rock. So it it is it's certainly a lot more technical than where I'm at in in Texas, uh, as far as trails go. There's a ton of public trails too. Uh, the UK in particular is has thousands and thousands of miles of free public trail, which is quite difficult to find here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for me the big the biggest difference I think is the uh, n not the culture. The culture is actually very similar. The trail running culture, the the people and and the whys of all the people doing it is, is quite similar. The aid station food is very different, which I love it. I love it. I I have a big problem with aid station food over here. It's a bugbear of mine. But I love the food that they have over there. So what do they have over there? That's so. Uh, they what what well, would so, you put at your aid station if you're an aid station captain and you're like you know what. We're making this international flair. What are yeah. you putting at your aid station? I'm gonna have like croissants. I'm gonna have uh, I'm gonna have savory items, like real food, mm -hmm. which is what they do over in the, in the UK. Uh, but I don't seem to find that a lot here. Here it's more Pringles, Oreos, your gummy bears. And that's hey, just quesadillas like at 3 a.m. can save your race. I don't mind so. quesadillas. Yeah. And I <laughs> I ran a race. Uh, shout out to the Ultraverse supplement folks. Uh, the Cowboy 200 that I ran was absolutely fantastic from a food perspective. Every aid station they had had proper food, hot food, uh, had everything. I had I had burgers galore. I had quesadillas. I think I had these big German brats uh that you could walk down the trail with you know like fistfuls of these things um and it ended pierogies? in a brewery they have pierogies there i don't know if they have pierogies but but it ended in a brewery and they had beer in the aid station along the way so i was like this is like insanely cool um yeah they uh they made they made sandwiches for you while you stood at the aid station like so i mean i just that's the kind of food i'm after i struggle mightily with most aid station food it's these empty calories that i guess me personally i i have a problem with so when i go back to the uk like if you go race uh like they have they have french bread with ham and cheese 
at an aid station, which is really cool. Um, so I, I mean, just it's very different, but I find it a lot more filling. So I try to bring stuff back with me and use it on a race uh, if I can. Um, but yeah, it, the s scenery is obviously very different. The weather is usually terrible. Um, <laughs> it, it really is where I race. Uh, so I race it a lot in the northwest of England and in uh, Wales, uh, if you're familiar with Wales. Absolutely beautiful, historic, mythic, Celtic country. Mountains, deep legend and mythology. Absolutely phenomenal place. A language you will never understand and will never be able to read, even though they put it on the signposts everywhere. Um, but a, a magnificent place. Um, the weather is terrible. Just there's no other way around it. It rains and it rains and it rains. It's cold. It's cold in summer. It's even colder in winter. It snows. There's ice. So what's uh, the appeal to running there? Just the beauty of the nature? Or... Yeah, it, it is very beautiful. It's it's very pretty. It's very remote. So you really feel like you're you're away from civilization. And for me, there's a lot of personal history in those areas. So. I'm in a phase of life where I'm quite nostalgic about places I grew up and people I used to hang out with when I was growing up in those places. So to get to, and I, when I was 18 or 20, I didn't give two hoots about the, the Lake district or the hills and mountains and stuff like that. So I never did any of that stuff when I was over there. So for me, it's sort of a, uh, again, back to the exploration. It's a journey of exploring parts of the UK and the countryside that I never really took the time to do when I was over there. So this is me going back and revisiting places of, of my childhood, towns and coastal villages and mountains that I never climbed when I was a kid and can barely get up now with uh, arthritis in my back. So, uh, you know, so it's good. And you know what, uh, they race mostly, so their race calendar is flipped because it's super cold over there, they don't do a whole lot of racing through winter. Whereas here in Texas, the winter is the prime race time here. So if you want to run a race, uh, winter in Texas, especially Southeast Texas, is the prime place to come. It's never super cold here. Um, so there's a lot of racing here between sort of October and kind of now. That's our prime race season. So we have a ton of races going on down here right now. We kind of shut down over summer, but the UK is the other way around. There is because it's so cold over winter. Their racing is mostly summer based, and so I can get over there and run races in their summer, which is probably 60, 60 degrees and raining. Uh, is, is pretty typical for summer um, over there. But I love it. I, it's just it feels very different. the The countryside, the towns, the people that you meet are all super friendly. It just it feels very different to over here. Um, and for me, there's the nostalgia aspect of running in places that I know and went to as a kid. And now I get to go back and kind of experience those again. And in some cases, bring my own child with me and show show him um, places where I used to go. So yeah, I, I love running over there. And they don't have crap aid station food. <laughs> if I can just get that plug in, if there are any race directors listening, please up your aid station game. Um, now, I think what... we can do better than Pringles and gummy bears. Now, here's Oreos. what I will tell you, because you are signed up. I don't know. You're waitlisted for I, oh, a no certain business. race that is yeah. very near and dear to our hearts on this show. Yes. They, Brian and Shelly do a fantastic, now they do have Pringles. Um, but overnight you'll get gnocchi, you'll get quesadillas, you'll get cup of noodles, you'll get real food. They try to have pizza at all these aid state, like they do a very good job. So you will probably find yourself in that race. Just historically, if you're on the wait list, odds are you're getting in. Um, really they, you will early on your overnight aid stations are yeah. buffets of whatever you want pretty much. So I was interested I hope you, to I hope you have that to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, well, so so here's two two uh kind of flips to that. The I ran the Bandera 100k this year in January, which is uh I think it was. I don't know if it still is Western qualifier, uh, Western States qualifier uh golden ticket, but 
Um, either way, I ran it this year. That's a Hoka sponsored event. So there's Hoka stuff everywhere on that course. Their aid station, and it was really cold at night, went down to freezing uh, at night in January out in the hill country in Texas. So it was very cold. Their aid stations had fruit snacks, Oreos, Pringles, no hot drinks, no hot, no ramen, no, no hot anything. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I just, myself and runners that we, uh, I was with, we were shivering, shaking, and we couldn't get over the fact that this is a massive Hoka sponsored event and that's their aid station set up through the day. Mm -hmm. So it's a little disappointing. And then I was listening to Stephen uh, on uh, Stephen Cornhouse talk about Leadville and how the sponsorship for Leadville came in uh, and put all the goos, uh, you know, their aid stations are predominantly goo based. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, gosh, this is what I'm talking about. Like, can we not do better with aid station food? Um, so it's it, it's really just the race directors, in all honesty. I mean, so, you know, I'm just going to call out three really good ones here. So if, if you run any of Steve Durbin races, if you run any of Jason Green races, or if you run any of Sean Blanton's races, you are going to be fed. Okay, at Tunnel Hill, hamburgers, hot dogs hot soup at everyone at, at, at once you get to the halfway point of, of, of that race. Okay. Um, Jason Green's races, uh, once you get past, once you get to like the, you know, probably the 50 K point Garrett saw all the food they had. I mean, they have like a spread there. They got the soup. They have the whole nine yards. Sean Blanton's race. I remember I ran the Chattanooga 50 it was wonderful. We got to mile, uh, gosh, maybe about 20 ish miles in, uh, he had, he had, uh, a guy made me, he literally made me an omelet. He said, what do you want? Nice. I, I, he said, I can make you an omelet right now. I said, in fast enough time, he goes, tell me what you want. I said, bacon, eggs, and some ham dude whipped it up, hand, handed it to me. And I mean, I ate it. So I, I think really it's, you know, it, it, the main thing is knowing, you know, when you sign up the type of, of race directors that you have and what they're going to provide, Jason doesn't have a whole lot of sponsors. Durbin doesn't really have a whole lot of like real corporate style sponsors, neither yeah. does Sean Blanton. Um, so I think it allows them to have a little bit more flexibility in the type of food they provide. I know Brian and Shelly work with Hoka a little bit, but they still have a huge spread of food, um, at their, at their races. And I mean, that's just from experience of running all these folks races here locally here within the, the Southeast, I called out. So. That's one of the really cool things I like about the journey running too. I mean, uh, if you're screwed, at least like I run these, you get to pick where and when you eat. So this, the, the Swami shuffle, I stopped at, uh, oh yeah, I had the seven 11 warm food, which is pretty nasty and a big risk, but I got to choose to do <laughs> I just it. Can't get over the fact that you were eating hot dogs off rollers and taquitos off rollers. that have been sitting there all yeah. day. Like I just <laughs> sitting there all day, man. And I actually, I took a picture of it. And I sent it to my wife and I, and I, I think I wrote, I'm about to eat this. And she wrote back, oh, you are going to regret that in a minute. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, but I ate it anyway. It, it, was, it wasn't too bad. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I got to stop at a, there was a, a great uh, pub bar on the way back, Art's Place. And I had the best, uh, I had the best burger and fries there. And he kept bringing me Coke and, and uh, I had a couple of beers while I was sitting and then I got up and carried on on the race. So, but on these journey style things, you get to pick what you eat. You're not behooven to whatever is at the aid station, be it good, good or bad. Um, you, you, you get to kind of choose. So I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. John would stop at every Taco Bell he saw. I have to tell you, I was really, I was really annoyed at one point. There was a, uh, maybe this is an outer banks thing because everywhere just shuts and, uh, there was a there was a Taco Bell that advertised that it was open until nine o'clock, and I booked it to get there by nine o'clock, and I arrived at eight fifty seven, and they locked the door, and I could see them behind the counter, and I'm banging on the door, and they're like, "No, sorry, we're closed." I'm like, "Dude, it's not nine o'clock yet. It's like eight fifty seven or whatever it was," and they were like, "No, sorry, you can't." I just want a taco. Yeah. I know you're getting ready to throw just, me. Yeah, I know you're going to throw it away. You're going to chuck it away. Like, 
I'll take them. It's okay. So that's when I had to go to 7-Eleven over the road um, and have the 7-Eleven experience. That was, that was pretty good. Uh, and that was, that was right after I had spent, spent the night in a post office in Avon. I don't know if you know that, uh, but there's a good, good tip. If you're ever out on the road, uh, post offices are open 24 hours and are warm. They're heated. So yeah, I, uh, I bunked down and, uh, uh, I won't call it sleep. I dozed off here and there for three hours in a post office in Avon, got up and walked my way to the Taco Bell only to be turned down. So I'm not a fan at the moment of Taco Bell, though I'm sure it'll come around. Well then, I think that's about our hour before I let you go. You boys have any other questions or anything you want to pry out of Mr. Richard here? Oh man, it was, it's been interesting, uh, you know, hearing your take on the 200 miles. So, you know, thanks for, thanks for joining us and, and, and going over that. That was really cool. Yeah. They're not as bad as you think. If you can get your head around it, they're very doable. Oh, wait, Garrett, before you sign off, can I do one thing? I want to shout out Josh Rosenthal, who was just on the show, uh, recently, Finished the Zion 100 today. Uh, for anybody who listened and was wondering whether or not he made it, he finished it. Uh, so hot damn, way to go. He finished it. And so we're, we're at 22% finish rate for Mr. Josh now, I believe. So congratulations to him. Fantastic. Uh, it's a big, yeah, it's a big deal. So, all right. Sorry, I got my plug in. I'm done now. All right, Gary. <laughs> John, do you have anything? Um. Because no, you're I mean, much uh, more, you're much more of the adventurist out of the two, out of the three of us. Yeah, I think so. I think for me, like the 200 mile distance would rely heavily on finding a course that I can get inspired by. Like it would have to make sense to me. Like I wouldn't want like a like you know just like a like a looped course, like on a 10 mile course or anything like that. Um, out of the 200s you have run, which one would you be the most likely to recommend to someone who is interested in that distance? I I really enjoyed the Cowboy 200 in Nebraska. I was uh, running across Nebraska. It is a rail trail, so it's not particularly, well, it's not at all technical, but it was very well run company. It finishes in a brewery. The aid stations were brilliant. Uh, and the the towns along the way are involved in the race. So they man the aid stations and they're all into the runners. So they're really excited to see the runners. And it, I mean, when I did it, they were giving you parts of history of their little town in Nebraska and what was going on. So it, it has this sort of super community feel about it, uh, but it's big and long enough that it's a pretty decent challenge. Um, I will say we, we talked about hallucinations. That is the one race where I did have a hallucination. I saw a giant ape uh, in the dark one night that I swore was there. And then the person I was with is like, I don't know why you would see an ape, but uh, just a big tree. But that was really cool. For the I got same to see reason a... I saw a school bus in the middle of the woods with John. It, it <laughs> yeah. makes no sense why it's there, but damn it, it was there. <laughs> yeah. I um, got to see it on that race. I. I got to see a lunar eclipse and a comet shower as part of that race too, which was pretty cool. And then at Moab last year, I saw a solar eclipse. So within 12 months, I saw a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse uh, that's, while that's running. That's super cool. Is the, uh, is the Cowboy, is that a point-to-point -point course? It is, yes. It's point-to-point yeah. -point 200. It starts in Norfolk, uh, yes, Norfolk, Nebraska, which is just slightly west of uh, Omaha. And then it runs directly west to Valentine, Nebraska, and it hits a bunch of small Nebraska towns along the way, all of which are super community based. And uh, it's an excellent race uh, for a kind of an entry to 200s where it's it's remote enough, but not like super remote and good distance between aid stations and really, really well run race and well, well stocked aid stations. Very cool race. Yeah, almost sounds that, like it's got a Yeti feel. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, it almost sounds like it kind of has a bit of a Yeti type of feel because Yeti, 
the, the whole community of Damascus comes together for the Yeti 100. So you guys might find a little more home there than I would just because the only Yeti event I've run is that 24 hour virtual. So we're working on changing mm -hmm. that too. So, well, Richard, I meant oh. it when I said that you have the smoothest voice in podcasting, I'm going to go ahead and say it that if Morgan Freeman had a podcast, he'd want it to sound like yours. So go ahead and check out choose to endure wherever you get your podcast, correct? Apple, Spotify, all those places. Yes, sir. All those spaces uh, and places and choose to endure.com if you so choose. Perfect. And then you can find him, obviously, on Instagram and all those things there. So, Richard, thanks again for your time tonight. We appreciate it. And uh, you have piqued our curiosity, I think, when I say for at least two of the three of us. I don't know if Jason has any curiosities about the 200, but uh, I might be listening a little bit more if someone says, hey, let's go run 200 miles. So thanks again Give for coming on tonight, and we appreciate all of your time. Thanks, gents.